Let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. We'll read our text and then we'll ask God to help us with our focus. For me in particular, I, am a, I, am a, I don't do well being late to anything. It agitates me quite a great deal. Now that's just my personality. I know it's a flaw. And uh, one of those things I have to overcome. Charlie tried to help me with it for years. <laughs> and, uh, just... <laughs> when Chuck Dowens beats you to church. Oh. <laughs> That's just rough, man. He was, he, was, he was early tonight. I, I get, I, <laughs> early is relative to me. I don't think about it. <laughs> we, we literally, uh, Google said we were going to be here at 20 something after. Yeah. 20 cents. Yeah, so about right now is when we're supposed to get here, and so it worked out much better. The uh, Lord gave us wisdom. We found a route. We were able to drive backward on the shoulder. And, uh, <laughs> 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 Not really, but it's really interesting because we, we came onto Broward Boulevard where the tri-rail station is. There's a tri-rail exit and then an entrance back on, and we were able to just bypass all the traffic uh, by getting off and on. Nobody else was doing that. I mean, it was flying after that. There was a vehicle up on its side. And so we, when we prayed, I was pray for those folks as well. There's about three or four accidents behind that as well. It's pretty rough. A lot of people out there today. We noticed in Miami Beach, man, there are just, just millions of people out. So I guess it's, uh, I don't know what's the cause. I think it's just the beautiful weather. But uh, here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And uh, we're going to look at the transition, the transition uh, phase. In Israel, <clears throat> First Samuel is that portion of the Scripture where we see the transition in the rule of Israel from a theocracy where God used judges to deliver Israel to a monarchy where uh, they're going to ask for a king. I just want to analyze that a little bit this evening and uh, ask the Lord to give some <coughs> wisdom, some insight into the mindset behind what the people were asking for when they asked for a king. Okay, so if you found verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 8, let's look down and begin to read. The Bible says, It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of, the first, of his firstborn was Joel. And the name of his second, Abiah, they were judges in Beersheba. <clears throat> Here's the tragedy of it. His sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. What's well, a tragic, tragic portion of Scripture, isn't it, to read? Yeah. And so let's pray and, and we'll, uh, we'll ask for God to help us with some of the things that are real life that people deal with and respond in the wrong way to. So God, I just pray that this evening you would give us understanding of the Scripture and that you would as well help us to be able to evaluate things that the, the Word of God teaches are clearly not your design, not your intent, not your will. And that as a result of our looking at it, we would see how that we could respond differently. God, we are just not better than any sinner. We're not better than any wicked person. And, uh, but yet, by your grace, we can have victory. And it's ours to have. And God, we can, we can see success. We can uh, live lives that please you. And I pray that these would be the things that would drive us and uh, motivate us and that the truth of the Scripture this evening would be a warning to us, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, you know, the uh, last couple of weeks as we've been in 1 Samuel, one of the things that we focus quite a bit on is on Eli. And, of course, uh, we, we were introduced to Samuel as a young man I uh, really kind of saw a contrast between the parenting of uh, Samuel's mom and uh, Eli as a father. One of the things that stood out for me about Eli was <clears throat> when God came to Eli and gave him the warning, this is what's going to befall because of the wickedness that your sons are doing. And then Eli's response was to go and to confront his sons, to, to talk to them about it. And he said, you know, hey, it's not good what you're doing. And you're making the people transgress. And what's going to happen if uh, if you don't do right? This is a bad thing. <clears throat> and so we see Eli 
uh, did the motto today, which is see something, say something. See something, say something. That's a motto that bothers me. I believe in the see something, do something uh, mindset. You don't see something and say something, but that's what Eli did. On the face, as we read the Scripture, there was nothing wrong about what Eli said to his sons. But when we read about what God said about Eli, what did God say? Didn't restrain him. He said, you didn't restrain your sons. You should have done something, Eli. And he held Eli accountable for it. And you know, oftentimes in the church, <clears throat> we tend to we tend to preach sometimes, I think, uh, that we're not accountable for the outcome of anything. You ever know, you know, heard the Calvinism child rearing? I'll be honest with you, if I were a Calvinist, I wouldn't have children. I don't have children anyway, so maybe I am. Who knows? <laughs> but the truth is, is I wouldn't want children if I were a Calvinist because I believe that God might want one of them to go to hell. I don't know how, I just don't know how if they died before me, how I could handle that. Uh, the, the idea that one of my children would be in hell. You know, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. You're a parent here this evening. Let me just tell you something. Believe the Bible. Believe the Bible. I have, I don't know how many times heard that scripture read and then unpreached, untaught. You say, well, pastor, Proverbs are axioms. They are wise sayings, but they're not always true. You know, it would be really interesting if the Apostle Paul believed that and didn't quote Proverbs in Romans. And we could say, well, it's not Scripture. No, it's Scripture. It's the Word of God. It's a promise to you. And, you know, there is a greater sense of responsibility, but there is also a great comfort in it. And that is that if you do right, you'll have God-given results. You'll have God-guaranteed results. You know, we could, we could preach the same thing with Eli. We say, Eli loved the Lord. Do you think Eli loved the Lord? I think he did. Eli was a good man. You think he was a good man? I think he was. You know, he did everything right. No, he didn't do everything right. He did not restrain his children. Is what the Bible says. And we don't want to overlook passages like that, but the Scripture is very, very clear about it, very apparent about it. And there's no help for you. Listen, you can be compassionate. You can look at my face right now and say, Pastor, you don't sound very compassionate. Listen, I don't think there's anybody that has more compassion for failure than this failure. Isn't it hold yourself up to a standard and hold it and look down at other people? No, the reality of it is, is that we've all failed, have we? We've all fallen. Not, nobody's, nobody is saying anyone's perfect. But if you can't figure out what the problem is, you'll never come up with a solution for it. If you can't acknowledge, if you can't acknowledge blame, you can't acknowledge the thing, you can do something about it. You can never help yourself and you can never help anyone else. And we as believers need a little bit of that help. It's tragic today what's taught oftentimes which excuses and covers up our sin, the things uh, that we know. Let me just speak a little bit from practical personal experience. And I don't want to go off on this too much. Uh, but I don't know how many good, godly Christian parents, you know, the ones that say, I'm a good, godly Christian parent. Those, the ones that say, I did everything right. I taught my kids. I... I did everything right. I put them in a Christian school. And then they proceed to tell me why their kids turned out wrong. And their pastor will tell you why. They'll tell you, well, you know what? I thought the Christian school was a good Christian school, but, uh, you know, it turned out there were bad influences there. You know who the Bible says is supposed to raise the children? I love Christian schools, and I think, I think you can benefit greatly. I've personally benefited greatly by a good Christian school. But you know whose fault it would be if I didn't turn out? My parents. You know, I, I shouldn't have trusted the Christian school. Well, you shouldn't have. That's true. You know, you've got to know what's going on with your, with your kids. But here's what I want to say about that. I've spoken to their children. You know, the children don't tell the same story. Sometimes they start off by telling the story they think that you want to hear. But then you say, what's the real story? Real story is my dad made me read the Bible, but he didn't. Real story is my mom, you know, this is what they said, but here's what they did. My parents, this is what's actually going on in their marriage. These, this is the real truth. These are the real things. And what I saw was that they had a standard for Christ, for me, and they had a standard for themselves. And friend, listen, it's a fine thing. Now, let me just tell you something. I, I, I used to think that to do as I say and not as I do is the wrong thing as a parent. Here's how you do that if you're a parent. You say, Pastor, I you know so much about parenting. Well, I was a child, so I got all kinds of experience. Okay. Uh, here's how the do as I say, not as I do works for you as a parent. Be humble. Have some humility. Try it sometime. I remember my dad, my dad just broke my heart one time. My brother and I, I don't even remember the circumstances, but I remember my brother and I were teenagers, and we, my dad had told us he didn't want us doing something. 
and, it, and, and, and his life at the time wasn't a good example for us. And I remember my brother saying something like, well, you, about my dad, and my dad said, you want to be like me? I just broke my heart as a teenager, and I realized my dad doesn't want to be the way he is. Being defeated spiritually, being a believer, and being in a time of defeat in your life, it's not a good thing. You know, parents sometimes just say, you know something, I'm not a good example for you, but I want better for you. That's what Eli ought to have done. Ought to have done. Just said, I'm not a good example for you. You know, that helped me to realize, you know something, right's right. I may not have a great human example, but I have a perfect Christ example. And that's, that's what I, that is my standard for me. A little bit of humility. A little bit of, I, I, you know what, maybe I failed in that area. Maybe I'm not what I ought to be. And the ability to say, you know, I'll change and I'll do right. By the way, my parents, man, they've grown since then, doing a lot better from that time. Thank God for that. Thank God. But you gotta, it takes a little dose of humility sometimes and just a bit, a bit of ownership. And, you know, in life in general, this is just, just reality. You can do something about the person sitting in your seat. There are certain things which you are helpless to change, but God is not helpless in those situations. But it's incredible how often we want God to change a person, but we're not willing to be changed in our area. Well, I'll do this if they will. No, you do what you're supposed to. You do what you know is right and what you ought. And then let God do what God does. And He does amazing, yeah. miraculous things. Uh, a brother in, in, in the Lord, a new, new believer, just recently testified to me. He said, you know, I just wouldn't have believed a year ago that God could do that with that person. Just wouldn't have believed. I just, I just wouldn't have believed it. But it looks like he did. What a wonderful thing that is. God can do impossible things with people. God can take a person's situation and literally just lock them up and make them so they can't do what they want to do. And make it so that they have to face reality and they have to face uh, the, their sin. And, and, and God will do that, but he does it after he works on you. And so that should have been Eli's model. The tragedy of it, though, is really what really brings me almost to tears, and that's reading Samuel's life, reading about his sons. I mean, Samuel knew intimately <laughs> Eli's problem and, and, and Eli's son's problem, didn't he? I mean, he knew. He knew what the issue was, why they should have been the next high priest, but why he ended up being in that position instead. And then he raises his sons and, and they get appointed judges of Israel and they're as corrupt and as crooked as they could possibly be. They're accepting bribes and perverting judgment, the Bible says. So people come to them for righteousness, for rightness and, ju <coughs> excuse me, and justice. And you know, if you haven't done wrong, you know it, don't you? If you're innocent and, and you're seeking justice and you know that you're in the right and then you see justice corrupted and perverted, what does it do for you? Well, a lot of cynical people were out there. A lot of people that because uh, they have seen uh, justice perverted, their assumption is that there's no justice. And so that's where we're at this evening. I just want to analyze it, look at it briefly in the Scripture. I should stop saying briefly. There's probably nothing brief about looking at it tonight. Uh, somebody just keep the score and just, just yell it out every now and again. So <laughs> now I won't tell that story. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm kidding about that. Just you know, It'll be just fine. Nothing happens until the last two minutes, right? And you shouldn't be watching the NFL anyway. Okay, so <laughs> we'll be all right, won't we? We all can take it. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Well, let's stop there just for a minute. <coughs> Joel and Abiah, his sons, when he got old, Samuel made them judges over Israel. Do you think he might have known a little about their character at this time? Mm -hmm. There's a problem right here, isn't there? There's a problem right here. Nepotism, if you will. You say, Pastor, in the, in the Levitical priesthood system, the next in succession. Well, that didn't work out for Eli, did it? Uh, it, it, it wasn't right for Eli, so there could have been an alternative. You know, right here is where we stop and say, God, what should we do? Right here is a time when, had Samuel responded right, he should have said, you know, God, I've got a problem right now with my sons. Uh, you know, in the church, there are standards for this, aren't there? The Bible talks about a pastor, if he doesn't rule well his own house, he's not qualified to be a pastor. Deacons in the church, 
if they're not if if they're not ruling well their house, their children, they're not qualified for the position. What are they supposed to do? Well, they don't have to hold the position. The problem is, is that probably at this stage, at this point, now I'm not going to add more to the scripture than what it says. But a heartbroken father ought to say, you know, the worst thing in the world would be to lose my children. But he tries to win his children by putting them in that place of trust, it seems. You ever seen someone do that? They haven't done anything really bad. Maybe if they get the responsibility of the position, maybe they'll step up. And maybe they'll develop character that they have not previously displayed. I don't know what the thought process behind it is, but... I do not think that Samuel's sons, Joel and Abiah, manifested their bad behavior after they became judges. It wasn't the first... Sam, I never saw that before. I didn't know they were like that. Were that true, don't you think it might have... Uh, don't you think it might have been because Samuel didn't know his children like he ought to have? You say, Pastor, but, but you know we're talking about different era in Israel. Let me ask you a couple questions. Did Israel have the law? What did the law say about fathers and teaching their children? They're supposed to do it, right? They're supposed to read the Scripture with them. They're supposed to uh, teach the Scripture, help them memorize the Scripture. Uh, they're supposed to train their children. You know, it, everything that God did by way of a miracle in delivering Israel was supposed to be a memorial. And every time you saw a memorial, then parents are supposed to say, Now, son, here's what happened. Yeah, I know, Dad. I heard it a million times. But I'm going to tell you again. Here we go. You know, you ever had your dad give you the lecture or the lesson? And, uh, you know, yeah, I've heard him answer, yeah, I know, but I'm going to tell you again. And here you go. Here's what happened. Man, I'll tell you, you say it over and over and over and over again because you want it to get in the hearts of your kids who God is. Evidently, though Samuel would have been a primo uh, judge of Israel, I, there's no question about Samuel and his personal character, is there? Is there? I mean, can you t can you tell me of an instance where Samuel failed in the duty as a high priest in Israel? No, he was an example. He's, tell me a better high priest that Israel had. Throw out a name, will you? I mean, Ezra was probably a pretty good one, I would say, right? But tell me a better high priest than Samuel. See, it's not an attack on Samuel and his character, but it is. It is that Samuel made a bad decision. And let me give you another illustration. You remember after Saul had, Saul had failed and God had rejected him from being king and he was supposed to anoint David king. Do you remember what Samuel did when he went to Jesse's house and saw his sons? Remember his response to the sons of, of Jesse? Well, this one likes to, looks like a king. Well, this one looks like a king. Well, this one looks like a king. And what did God say about each of them? No. 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 I rejected him. What did God say? God said, The Lord seeth, not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, God seeth the heart. Christian, this, this ought to be logically as plain as the nose on our face. You know, if you can't know everything, that you better go to the person who does. I said, this is really where Samuel should have been. In other words, God, Joel, keep saying Joel, we've got a Joel here. Where's Joel? He's over. We're not talking about you. Okay? All right. What's that? No bribes. No bribing Joel, man. No perverted justice over here. All right. Uh, Joel, bye. You know, these guys have these character issues. God, what should I do? What should I do? The Bible says Samuel. did say God made them judges. It said Samuel made them judges. Doesn't it? You see that? And so that's the first area where we see is the wrong response. Friend, humility. Humility. What are people going to say if I'm the judge of Israel and after Eli's failure to raise his sons right, what are people going to say about me? What are people going to say about me if I can't anoint my own sons judges over Israel? I think that's the question. It's the wrong question, isn't it? Humility, friend. Humility. Humility. You don't have to be. Your sons don't have to be judges. In other words, the real thing is, ought to be, what do I have to do to win my children? What do I have to do in order to win my children? And you know, 
I haven't seen everything, haven't been everywhere, but I've seen this win children. I've seen parents just say, you know, nothing's more important to me. I'm not, I don't care. I don't care what people think about me. I'm not concerned about that. That isn't the matter. You know, that teaching your children to worry about what people think about them instead of what God thinks about them is a real danger. Really dangerous. You know, everybody in church is going to think, stop thinking like that. And just be practical about it and have enough humility to say, you know something, what God knows matters more than what people think. What God knows matters more than what people think. And that would have helped Samuel at this juncture. We know in verse 3, they took bribes, they perverted judgment, and turned aside after lucre. <clears throat> so Samuel's response was wrong. Right? He appointed them judges when instead he should have asked God for help. In other words, he made a move when he didn't know what the right move was. was God, what else can I do? Well, don't just do something because of A or B. I've learned that in life quite a few times. When A and B aren't good, don't pick between them. Don't choose between two bad decisions. We do this all the time, don't we? You know, it's like the, the, the best of two evils that we go for, and, 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 and evil's just evil. Now, verse 3, or I'm sorry, not verse 3, verse 4. The elders of Israel, their wrong decision. And all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Hey, you're old. Well, they said, Behold, thou art old. Well, that's the wrong way to begin a conversation anyway. <laughs> Behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Well, let's stop there. Let's analyze that statement. What's wrong with what they've said at this point besides calling Samuel old? Is there anything wrong here? No. See, they're right about what they're saying. What they're saying is right. And I'll be truthful with you. I don't think they said it in a mean spirit. You don't see them come and say, and Samuel, you're worthless, and I've always known you are, and the proof of it is how your kids turned out. Oh, no, they said, you know, you're old, and you've been a good judge, but your kids aren't like you. In other words, if your sons had walked in your ways, we'd be fine with it. Now, this is a little bit of a disingenuous statement. Because they're saying something that's true, but where they're going with their conclusion and their logic is not really honest. It really reflects that this is a way that we're going to be able to justify our bad decision. Whereas what you're wrong about is why we're... Have you ever met that person? There are Christians who are out of fellowship with God, out of fellowship with believers, and looking for something to blame. Right? They want something to blame for why they don't go to church anymore. I mean, just one thing. If, they, if someone will just do something. One more time. If he says that to me one more time. If they, if, 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 and they're looking for something, and when they find it, they're gone. They're going that direction. Well, behold, you're old. Thy sons walk not in thy ways. Okay, so let's get a better priest. What, was the, what happened with Eli when his sons went the wrong direction? Well, God gave Israel Samuel. Had there been judges in Israel before? Yes, sir. Yeah, there had. Had any of the judges in Israel before not done well? Yeah. You remember that guy Gideon? How did his sons turn out? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, do you remember um, uh, Samson? Remember that guy Samson? You know, wasn't the best judge. Is God able to do great things despite wicked people? The answer is yes. Could God have provided a better judge? And the obvious answer is yes, but what they said wasn't, okay, you're old and your sons aren't looking like they're going to be good, so thy sons walk not in thy ways, so make us another judge who is qualified. Now they said, now make us a king. You know, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They said, so your sons are really wicked and they're, they're, like, all, they're like the wicked people, so let's just go ahead and have a, a king like the wicked nations too. In other words, let's just go ahead and go all out with it. Let's just go ahead and justify it. And here in their statement, or in the conclusion of their statement, you find that their problem is not the perversion or the corruption of justice. 
That really isn't the motive behind what they just want to be like the other nations. And the tragedy of it is, is that they have so much more than the other nations. Friend, let's just stop here for just a second. And let's remember that what we have is better than anything. Better than anything anyone else has. And what we stand to lose is far greater than what anyone else could lose. You guys know the, you know the rigmarole. You know, Samuel's told by God they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Go ahead and let them, but you warn them. You tell them what's going to happen, and then give them their king. Now there's some insight here. The last one is some insight into God. Some insight into God. Now, because God allows something does not mean that God wants something or that God is pleased with a thing or that God cannot use the wrong thing. You know, churches are confused about this, aren't they? There are churches that do things that clearly contradict the Scripture mandates. For instance, here's one, 1 John chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How many believers love the world? Some, right? How many churches are worldly? Not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about debatably so. It's always easy to say, well, that person doesn't have the same standards I do. They're worldly. You know what? There are people that don't have God-given standards. In other words, God hasn't convinced or convicted them about a matter because it's probably not an issue that matters to them. It's not, it's not a problem for them, perhaps. And their, their standards aren't the same as mine. It doesn't mean they're worldly. But, you know, the church today, by and large, is worldly, isn't it? In other words, when we talk about growing churches, we're not talking about reaching lost people who don't believe that there's a God. And preaching the gospel in power and seeing people saved. We talk about growing churches today. We talk about getting the most Christians to come to our church. Growing the organization is normally what we're talking about. We talk about growing churches. I'm not saying they don't want lost people to come, but that just isn't the thing they're trying to grow a church with. They're just trying to attract the most believers and have the biggest organization and thereby be the most successful church. Most churches today, many churches today, have mantras that are like this. Come as you are. That's a disingenuous statement in and of itself because the fact of the matter is, is that what it's saying is that you can't go come as you are in a church that like ours that would not be the same as what they are. We're not trying to be worldly. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, uh, have you ever seen us tell somebody, you know, I just don't, I don't like the way you came. <laughs> you, know, uh, you can't come here like that. Uh, thus far, that's only been 12 years in our ministry, but thus far we have zero occurrences of telling people they cannot come as they are. So when somebody says, you know, in our church you can just come like you are. Well, that is that to say, now you say, Pastor, I know a church where you can't, I know, but that's, that's not this one, so it's not relevant to this conversation, is it? It's not most churches, so it's not relevant to those conversations either. When somebody says, you can come like you are in our church, what does that mean actually? Well, it doesn't mean what it says on face value. Because what you're saying is you can't go to that church as you are. That's the argument that you're making. What you really mean is leave as you are. It's really more like it, isn't it? In other words, we're not going to judge you. We're not going to condemn you. I like those statements too. Well, that's what we do. You know, you come in, I'm wearing my robe, sitting in the bench, and uh, we usher you up front in cuffs until we determine. <laughs> Did, you ever been to church? Do people judge and condemn? Since it's the Super Bowl tonight, let me tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of those pastors that, that harasses people. Uh, and makes it worse because it's a Super Bowl. You guys are in church. I'm glad you are. So thank you for being here tonight. I'm just teasing, so I hope you know that. Uh, but I went to a church one time, and I wore a suit coat because I'd never been there before. It was a Wednesday night. I wore a sport coat, and I was a visitor there. And when I came in, the ushers greeted me. They were friendly, and they said, we don't wear, we don't wear sport coats on Wednesday nights. I thought, well, that's really awkward because I'm wearing one. <laughs> I go in another person. We don't wear sport coats on Wednesday night. We don't wear suit coats here on Wednesday nights. And then the pastor, I met the pastor. He said, yeah, we don't wear a suit coat here on Wednesday nights. 
I am one of these guys that has a very difficult time not saying things that occur to me to say. What I want to say is I should be allowed to come however I like. I should be able to come to this church however I like and not be judged for how I dress. I be able to come however I'm comfortable. And for me, being comfortable was wearing a sport coat to church that night. And do you think I care a bit about somebody wearing a sport coat on Wednesday night? If I don't want to wear a sport coat to this church, I won't. And that's the honest truth of the matter. If I don't want to, I will not. There are reasons why I think it's a good idea most of the time. But I've preached in jeans and a t-shirt before because that's how I got here. That's just, you know, it's not comfortable for me. I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable that way, but that was what I did. And uh, so, see, the statements aren't really honest, are they? They're really disingenuous. And this statement, <laughs> excuse me, that the children of Israel here are making isn't really honest, is it? In other words, they don't want a king because there can't be a good judge. They want a king because they want to be like the other nations. That's the issue. And uh, their attitude toward God, see, we're talking about God now in His perspective. You know, God knows exactly what's going on with them, doesn't He? He had their conversation with Samuel, and the gist of this conversation is, Samuel, I know. I know exactly what it is. Samuel says, God, they're wrong. And God says, Samuel, you're right. They're wrong. I understand that. But uh, let's go ahead and do it. And for the rest of Israel's history, as we'll begin to see, they got to have the consequences of having kings. Saul was a fabulous individual. He was like the Lone Ranger. When he uh, first became... Uh, I like, you ever watch the Lone Ranger really in the introduction they say he was a fabulous individual Saul was a great king I mean, he was little in his own sight and, you know he was an admirable man and I'll be honest with you somehow Saul raised one of the best men ever didn't he you find me a better man than Jonathan and you give me a church full of Jonathans you talk about a man who embodied what a godly good man ought to be. Courage. <laughs> hey, let's go take on a hundred guys. <laughs> Remember when the, and, his, and his armor bearer? Let's go up to the garrison of the Philistines. I mean, that's a guy, isn't it? I mean, Jonathan, you know, a courageous man. Humility. God wants you to be king, and I'm going to be your best servant. God doesn't want me to be king. I don't want to be king. And, you know, it's my right to be king. No. It's whoever God wants to be anointed, it's their right. And it's you, David. He died. I, I, I cry when I read the story of Jonathan dying. And it's, it's, a, it's a happy ending, honestly. Nothing wrong with Jonathan, the way that he died. But it's just tragic to me. I, you know, I feel so badly for Jonathan. And then I realize, you know, Jonathan didn't feel it all badly for himself. And Saul raised a pretty good son. Jonathan was a pretty good young man, wasn't he? Now, so what's God's heart? What's God's attitude? Well, this is, this is the positive part of the message this evening. This is the part where we end up. God can take a mess and turn something good out of it, can't He? We looked at Joseph, looked at Joseph and saw, as for you, you intended evil, but God meant it for good. God knows what's evil. God knows who is evil. God is able to take evil, and God's able to make it good. And friend, God can do so for you, and He can do so for me. Have you ever made a wrong decision? Could you be, could you have enough humility to say, you know what, at that juncture in my life, I said the wrong thing, I did the wrong thing? You know, you could do that on a weekly basis. If you, if you interact with other people, you'll have said or done the wrong thing. How, I couldn't tell you how many times. I just want it to be a habit when I've done wrong to say, you know, yeah, I was wrong about that and I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have responded that way uh, that was wrong and would you please forgive me for that and that just goes a long ways God's able to take a person who can do that and you know this afternoon uh, Charlie was talking about he probably did this morning as well he was talking about people that God's used he talked about the murderers the, the category of murderers and so he included David and uh, he included Moses, and he included, uh, uh, who else, Charlie? What? Paul. Paul. Yes, you can go through a list of people that are just the worst of the worst. What could God do with it? 
Well, God can take the worst and He can, he can make the best. He can do the best things possible. And so here we see that God's never finished. God's never done uh, until it's over. Uh, I read the Revelation and I know how it's going to how it's going to end up, don't you? There's a time when God says, okay, enough, and it's over. But we're not living in that time right now, are we? No. We're living in a time where God's very gracious, very good, very merciful. And here as we look at our text this evening and we see Israel going off in the wrong direction into a monarchy when they should have been a theocracy, our conclusion ought to be able to say, you know what, I don't want to respond like Samuel did. I don't want to appoint guys that aren't right I don't want to be in a situation where I make a decision when I don't have to make the decision. I can let God do what God can do. Work a miracle. There wouldn't even be a story to tell. And Samuel responded that. There would just be nothing to tell. <laughs> there wouldn't be a parent here today that wouldn't say, I was in a moment when I was a failure. Would there? Is there a parent here? Don't raise your hand if you think this. Is there a parent here that would say, there's never been a moment when I was a failure as a parent. Well, what kept the whole thing from going south? How you responded in the moment. And that's, that's it. That's what it is. That's where, that's where you fear. That's where you turn. Okay, you're Israel. Samuel made a bad decision. He appointed his sons, and his sons are as bad as Hophni and Phinehas. Samuel, you need to remove your sons and we need to pray about God giving us somebody different. That's it, right? What if you get a pastor at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? What if you get a pastor at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church that's a Hoffner Phineas? We need to get rid of him. Right? We need, to, we need to fix the thing. In other words, if we get in a place where things are wrong, we need to get things right. That's what we need to do. I don't want to add too much here. But you ever notice that God had the, the Holy Spirit give Paul a letter to the church at Corinth? You ever notice that? I'd have left that church. Wouldn't you? There was a man there that was uh, that had taken his father's wife. There's another guy there was defrauding other Christians. People were divided over who they followed. Uh, they, they had gotten all out of whack on speaking and it was just a mess. I wouldn't have written them a letter. <laughs> would you? How many of y'all would go to that church? I wouldn't. God wrote them a letter. And the second letter that's in the Scripture talks about re restoration and the response that the church of Corinth had to that letter. God can fix problems. If people are the problems, God can fix people. But we have to respond right. So Samuel responded wrong. The people responded wrong. But God can still do something. It's never too late. God can still work. It's never too late. It's still not too late, is it? You're living. You're breathing. And God can take you. And He can do something with you. So this evening, don't leave here and say, you know what, boy, I'm a Samuel. <laughs> boy, I'm a Samuel's son. And I'm the children of Israel. This is what happened in my life. No, my friend. God. Look to God. And look at how God responded to their wrong responses. And all you'll see about God is graciousness and mercy. And that God can take a mess and He can work His plan and His will and He can use messy people to do it. Father, I just pray the next several weeks as we begin to look at the monarchy in Israel that we would see You in it. And I just ask, Lord, that these truths that we've looked at this evening would just ring and resonate in our hearts and our minds in a practical way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.